Uh, Aang, thank you for those kind words. When someone sets high expectations up for someone, uh, there's only one other place for them to go. <laughs> Down. <laughs> so I want to apologize in advance if I don't meet up to expectations. Uh, as he uh, shared, we've been going through the book of James uh, this summer, and this morning um, we finally come to the end. Our passage is going to be James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. Uh, we had opportunity already to read some of those words as a congregation. As we've been going through James, one of the things that becomes uh, apparent is that James doesn't mince words. He uh, gets straight to the point. He tells it just like it is, and sometimes that can be unsettling. Uh, it's, it's a little too much of the truth. All right. In our section this morning, we're going to see James arguably at his most pastoral. There's almost a, a heaviness um, to this section as he closes the letter. And so I apologize again because it's Labor Day weekend and many of us go into it uh, wanting it to be light, lazy, and lots of food. And uh, this is going to be deep. <laughs> but I'm going to try to take us in and out soon as I can, <laughs> and also because the kids are going to get restless <laughs> as well. But he's going to share some deep things, uh, and what he's going to do is talk about how hard times, tough seasons of life really take a toll on us. They can really cause us to wrestle with our faith, or perhaps even turn away from the faith. They can take such a toll as they even affect our relationship with others, those within our household and outside. Tough seasons of life are difficult to navigate through. And so he's going to go there with us this morning, but he wants us to see the role and the power of prayer in the midst of those seasons of life. And he's going to highlight for us three of those seasons, seasons of affliction, seasons of isolation, and seasons of disbelief. So we're going to get right into it, James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. Is anyone among you suffering, he should pray. Is anyone cheerful, he should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick, he should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth, and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The subjects of prayer uh, is really... It's a really challenging one. Uh, some of us here, uh, when it comes to prayer, it's probably something that comes easily to us, maybe even something we enjoy. Uh, what's more likely the case is that for many of us, prayer is hard. Uh, it's difficult to have regular rhythms of life where we are praying in and out of seasons. Tim Keller, in his commentary on prayer, uh, offered uh, this insight. He says, I can think of nothing great that is also easy. Prayer must be then one of the hardest things in the world. To admit that prayer is very hard, however, can be encouraging. If you struggle greatly in this, you're not alone. I find that uh, particular insight encouraging uh, for at least two reasons. One, it reminds us that uh, it's, it's going to take time, right? No one really just masters prayer. Okay. You're always working on it. 
And part of that is because at its core, that's not really a task. It's spending time with God. So you're constantly growing in your relationship with him. Right? You never really master your relationship with God. Right? There's a work that you're doing. The second reason why I find this insight encouraging is that there's going to be seasons of life where you really want nothing to do with God. (laughs) And yet what prayer is reminding us is that regardless, he's still worthy of your worship. He's still worthy. And that's really how James kind of opens up this section for us with verse 13. He sets the base. He sets the tone for the rest of the unit. Our youngest son, uh, Ephraim, uh, he loves the show Peppa Pig. I don't know if many of you are familiar with it, but it's everywhere. Um, And as soon as the theme song comes, his attention is glued to the TV. He is ready as soon as he hears the word Peppa Pig, ready to go. Okay. Uh, and it's interesting how the, the beginning of a show or a movie or a book really sets the pace. Right? And James is doing that here as he dives into seasons of life. Right? And right away, he sets your foundation. Whatever the season of life, God is still worthy of your praise and your worship. James has not allowed us at any time in this letter to let us use our circumstances to dictate who God is and how he ought to respond to us. The circumstances do not dictate who he is. He remains God yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchanging. He's steady ground. As for us, our circumstances will change. We'll have good times. We'll have bad times. We'll have seasons of high. We'll have seasons of low and everything in between. And so that's what he's using when he uses the words suffering and cheerful. He's really setting the bookends of our experiences in life. Everything in between, whether good or bad, God remains worthy of your praise and your adoration. And that's such a challenging word. But he sets the base from the get-go. He says, before we even dive into this very end, you must remember this once more. And that's the theme all throughout Scripture. In the Psalms, you hear this statement, God is good, his love endures forever. It's really sort of the chorus of Israel's narrative. You see it sprinkled all throughout the Old Testament. The Lord is good, his love endures forever. The Lord is good, his love endures forever. Why is that constantly repeated? Why is that the chorus of Israel's narrative? To set them, it's to anchor them in this one unchanging truth. That God is, he's he's eternal, he's unchanging. He alone is worthy to be worshipped. He alone can say, I am steady ground. And so from the get-go, He wants to challenge us. Let him be the one that anchors you, whatever season of life you're in. Let him be the one that reorients you through his word and through his spirit, whatever season of life you're in. Let him be who guides you, whatever season of life you're in. And so after he sets that foundation, he takes us now into three seasons of life. And we're going to Label them affliction, isolation, and disbelief. Moving on into verse 14, he says, Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and then to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. Briefly, let me say, this is one of the most difficult uh, verses in Scripture. Uh, and for two reasons. One, verse like it that you can compare it to with this sort of command that the prayer of faith is going to save that person. It's going to heal them. Uh, and two, in our own life and then also in, 
examples from scripture, we have some contradictions. Right? We, I'm sure, have had experiences where we've prayed for healing and God didn't heal. Or you pray that, Lord, please don't let that person die. And the person died. The classic example from Circum Corinthians is with Paul. Paul is afflicted with a thorn. We don't know what the thorn is. We don't know whether it's a physical pain or some relationship that's causing him heartache. But he's pleading with God to take this pain away. And God says no. He says, my grace is sufficient for you even in this season of pain. My power will be made perfect in weakness. He permits pain, he permits suffering, and yet he's still good. They are sometimes contradictions in our own minds, but they're not contradictions in the mind of God. The second thing, too, with sickness, when we see this word sick, it's not just talking about physical sickness. There's a broader uh, spectrum of meaning to it. It's affliction, it's pain, and it could be affliction of the mind, it could be affliction of the body, it could be affliction of the spirit. The three different ways, then, I've mentioned this is a difficult passage, and so throughout uh, the history of the church, there have been three popular ways that it tends to be interpreted. One of it is to say, well, what James is talking about here was only for that early period in the church. All right. It was common for them to see miracles happening left and right. And so what he's referring to is when the apostles were all there and the church was growing, was just beginning. But then once that time passed on, it ceased. The miracles sort of ceased. And so this passage won't make as much sense. That's one interpretation. Another one is to look at it as a ritual. Just apply those words, and you're good. Get oil, get some sort of ointment to sacrament or to consecrate whoever is being prayed for. Pray for them, and they'll get healed. And some traditions, and so maybe even some of you have been in some of those traditions, will take it even further. The person's not getting healed, it's because of their lack of faith. That's another interpretation. A final one is you can consider it as it's conditional. It depends. It's a case study. Treat it case by case. The issue with this one, though, is that it has nothing to do with what God can and can't do. It has everything to do with your circumstance. Well, this country here is less developed. There's probably more demonic activity, and so it'll make more sense if you see sort of more mir miracles. But this country here, it's more developed. There's more technology, right? There's medicine and health care, and, you know, we have ibuprofen. So it doesn't really matter as much. I am going to stand with a lot of scholars and thinkers that have gone before me and after me, much wiser than I, who've said, I am not sure how best to understand this passage. It's a challenging couple of verses. I've seen God do miraculous things when no one expected anything to happen. I've seen God use medicine <laughs> and use the operating room and use doctors and physicians it's both within his hands. <laughs> I will say this, though. It's quite dangerous, a theology, when we start to say that if you have a lot of faith, then you're going to have a lot of success. There's going to be a lot of blessings that come your way. But if you have little faith, you're going to have more suffering. You're going to have no success. It's a very dangerous theology. And Christ in the Gospels even reminds us the kind of faith I'm looking for and that I'm pleased with is faith as small as a mustard seed. It's the tiniest seed in that time. And the focus is not on the size of your faith. The focus is on the size of your God. God is good. He listens. He acts. He's present. Sometimes the pain will remain. And sometimes it will be taken away. And he remains worthy to be worshipped in all seasons of life. 
the hope that we have as people of God is what he's demonstrated to us at the cross. Sin and suffering are here, for sure. But there will be no more when he returns. And so, yes, we are going to get healed. But whether we experience glimpses of it here, eternity would unveil it. That those in Christ are the ones that receive the glory, the riches, the blessings that he freely gives. He freely gives. So in seasons of affliction, we're encouraged to go to this Lord in prayer and to pray for one another. Knowing that at the end of the day, he is the one that will make that decision of what happens. And that might be encouraging news for some, it might be discouraging for others. But the viewpoint is not on the circumstance, but it's on the God that is in control of every circumstance. One last point here on this season of affliction is this word, call for the elders to pray over them. I want to pause briefly because we're in a season of life right now where that's, uh, that's not so easy for a lot of members to do. Many of us have seen news reports, heard news, right, um, of the leaders in our congregation um, bringing harm to their congregation, misleading congregations, bringing a lot of pain to them because of allegations of sexual abuse or uh, of, of theft, whatever other vices. I mean, it's a hard time to trust the leaders when you're not sure how it is that they're following after the God that they want you to follow after. And what you see tends to have a lot of inconsistency. This is a challenging word both for leaders and for members. It challenges the members to humble themselves and to invite godly leadership into their life, to seek out godly counsel. It reminds you, you can't do this alone. You need others to speak into your life. And others more seasoned in their faith others that have gone ahead of you already. And God has placed an authority in his flock, men and women, to be the ones that give their life for your sake, that are there to serve you. So invite them into your life. Let them pray over you. The challenge, though, to the leaders is that they are living a life where members would want to do that. That they're living a life that's gracious, that's humble. They're living a life that shows what it looks like to be vulnerable because God knows it's difficult to be vulnerable before another person. It's difficult to ask for help. So if the leaders are not doing it, why should I? So we don't want to just casually just kind of go... Uh, swing, uh, quickly read past this or to quickly elevate or at least on a pedestal just because of the title. For those of you that are leaders or aspiring to be leaders, this is a tough word. Your life needs to be one such that members want to go to you and want you to come alongside them and to pray for them and to walk with them. Why? Because you're following after the Lord. On seasons of affliction, we're encouraged to pray for one another and to trust that the Lord will bring healing. Whether we see a glimpse of that in part, we can trust because of the finished work of Christ that we will see it one day in full. That's the hope that we have because of the resurrection of Jesus. And so we pray for one another whatever season of affliction they might be in. Second, in season of isolation. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The order of the day today is individualism. All right. And 
in this culture, isolationism seems to be the natural rhythm. You isolate yourself from others. The danger of that is that the more you do so, the easier it gets to cultivate sinning in secret. We're already all prone to sin. But the more you isolate yourselves from others, the more you keep others at bay, and you never allow anyone to speak into your life, the easier it will get to cultivate sinning in secret. And for some of you, that might be pornography. For some of you, it might be deception. Social media makes it very easy for you to say you're one person here, but you're not really that person anywhere else. The easier it will be to cultivate a life of bitterness and contempt, and no one will even know that you're angry at them. In James chapter 1, we're reminded that sin gives birth to death. It's not always, and in most cases, it's not instantaneous. It's a slow process. It's a decaying process. And what's happening is that then you start to slowly die inside. And some of you here this morning are dying inside. You've been sinning in secret for a while without letting anyone know whether those within your household or those that are walking alongside you or colleagues at work, whoever, but no one knows. And all that's really happening is you're becoming more and more a shell of yourself. And you're missing out on opportunities to know God and to be known by him, to love God and to be loved by him, to receive the healing that he wants to give to you. And it's healing that will come through prayers and through the presence of others. But you isolate yourself. And all that's happening is you're dying inside. So isolationism, all it's doing is just giving us ammunition to create, to cultivate more and more secrecy. And James pushes back on that. If you confess your sins to one another, if you allow others to walk with you, there's healing to be found. Now let's not romanticize this. It's going to be messy. Right? There is no perfect relationship. Right? There's no perfect journey. There's no perfect uh, form of intimacy. Right? That alone exists within the Trinity, which he invites us into through his son. But when we are doing life together, it's going to get messy. We're going to wound each other. We're going to hurt each other. But he gives us grace to walk alongside each other to ask for forgiveness from one another, to share the areas where we're struggling, where we're saying, look, I just need help. I've been going at this alone for a while now. I need help. So James is offering gently, but at the same time pleading, if you have been cultivating a life of secrecy, and where it's been easy for you to just be sinning in secret, reach out to the body. Invite men and women into your life to speak into your life. And the promise is that he gives grace to help you find healing, to help you grow, not only in relationship with him, but in relationship with the very people he would have you journey alongside. final point is the power of prayer now in the seasons of disbelief. It's interesting that uh, James uses the example of Elijah. Elijah is one of the greatest prophets, and uh, in this particular reference here in James, he's going back to 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. I won't share too much on that story, but uh, Elijah there is a, is a fugitive. Uh, the king wants nothing of him. In fact, the king wants him dead. And it's because Elijah has been faithfully continuing to worship Yahweh, and the king has chosen to worship other gods and has commanded the people to do the same. And so if you're not doing that, right, you're really now uh, in danger. Right. 
So we see at the beginning of Elijah's story that God has used him and uses prayers uh, to keep rain from coming down. So for three years, it doesn't rain. And then later on, uh, after he presents himself again before the king and he proposes uh, that there be a challenge just to see which God really is the true God, whether the God of Israel or whether all of these false gods, uh, we see that Yahweh ends up being the true God because he causes rocks that have been drenched in water to burst into flames, which is impossible, by the way. And soon after that, he uses the prayers of Elijah again uh, to bring down rain. Now, the whole point of this, actually, it's nothing about Elijah. It's all about what God can do. Rain, water, winds, these sort of elements of nature are used often in Scripture to draw attention to this one fact, that the things that are out of our control, the things that are volatile, that are unpredictable, are well within the realms of God's control. I think it's one of the reasons why whenever we hear weather reports, uh, we're always amused by it. You know, it's going to, it's 50% chance it's going to rain today. Oh, so you're saying that it might rain, but it might not rain. That's awesome. That's good news. It tells you nothing, right? Well, the storms, you can't control the rain. But there's one who can. <laughs> and we call him Jesus. Mark chapter 4 is one of my favorite passages as it draws attention to that very fact. Right? Jesus is in the boat with the disciples, and they're about to get capsized. It is raining hard. There's thunderstorms. They're about to drown. It's the end. But Jesus is there with them. And they wake him up and said, Lord, we're about to die. And all he does is he goes out and he tells the wind and the rain, peace, be still. He is in control of the things that, humanly speaking, are uncontrollable. He is in control of the things that, humanly speaking, are unpredictable. He is in control. So what then does that have to do with seasons of disbelief and the power of prayer in that? I think a couple of things. One, God is unlimited in his ability and his creativity to use whoever and use whatever to accomplish his will. He's unlimited in it. And so you're freed up just like Elijah, as a child of God, not because he is a prophet, not because of his talents or his resume, but because of the God that he serves. You have infinite and intimate access to him to plead on behalf of others, to pray. To ask God to meet you in times where you are doubting, where you are struggling, where you know others are so wrestling with their faith that they're not sure where to go next or what to do next. Some of you might even have kids where you're seeing that happen in their life. For others of you, it might be you yourself. You're not sure at times what to do with this God. I know for me, about 10 years ago, I had a season of disbelief. I was a youth pastor at a church in the Philadelphia area Remember, I was a youth pastor, and for several Sundays, I wasn't at church. I was a youth pastor. Several Sundays, I wasn't at the church. No one checked up on me. I was a youth pastor. <laughs> for several Sundays, I wasn't at the church. And I was just disillusioned by this bride that is the church. And I became disillusioned with God. I'm like, God, I just see too many inconsistencies. <laughs> You're good, but there's a lot of things that I don't understand that are not good. You say to love, but I see a lot of hate. 
I don't understand. Now, God would use uh, lots of different men and women in that season of life to help me wrestle with God and to remind me, again, as James has been trying to do, that your circumstances don't dictate who God is. You let him dictate who he is. And he does so through his word and through his spirit. So God used people to do that in my life. But there's one in particular. His name was David. And I mention them because the interesting way God used them is that he shared out of his pain to help me better wrestle with God. And I find that fascinating because we don't usually do that. That isn't usually a recipe to then moving towards healing or to move, to move towards trusting more in God. But he shared with me how he's been wrestling. And that freed me up to do the same with him. And so what God did then was really just met with us as we were wrestling together. We didn't always have an answer. We don't always know why good things or happen to bad people or bad things happen to good people. Why your world suddenly is turned upside down the next day. We don't always have an answer. I think we need to rest in that. We do a disservice to people when we try to script away their suffering or their sin with a verse, or with a platitude. Sometimes the most unhelpful verses I've heard in times of pain is, well, it's for God's glory. I urge you not to say that <laughs> when you're walking with someone that's suffering. Just be with them. Pray with them. Walk with them. But don't dare dismiss their suffering with a cliche verse. God is unlimited in his creativity and his ability to accomplish his purposes. We don't always know what's going on. We don't always know what he's up to. But we can trust that he's good. He was good yesterday. He's good today. He'll be good tomorrow. We can trust that he's just. He was just yesterday. He's just today. He'll be just tomorrow. We will change. Who you were 10 years ago, it's not who you are now. It's not who you'll be 10 years from now. But God is unchanging. And that's why we rest on him. And we rest on his promises. Hebrews 6 reminds us of that as we're brought into the story, into the covenant that he makes with Abraham. And he says, there was no one else for me to swear by. There was no one greater. So I swore by myself. And so by two unchanging things, God's word and his character, we have promised that he will say and do what he promises to say and do. He will accomplish his will. And so if he says he's going to return again, he's going to return again. If he says he's going to make all things right, he's going to right every wrong. He is good. And so we stand on him because he alone can say, I am solid ground. And so we pray, we come to him, whether through words, whether through grieving, whether through singing, whether through silence. And we ask God to help us wrestle with things that often are just out of our understanding, beyond our understanding. And we pray and we ask him to work in the hearts of those who we know that they are struggling, but we don't know how to come alongside them. We entrust them into the hands of the one who is in control. The final point here, seasons of disbelief, is this promise Sin, sin doesn't have the last word in your life. Sin doesn't have the last word. But doesn't have your last word in Christ. I want to pause in that for a minute because 
there is going to be seasons, and I'm sure some of you guys are in that, where you're not quite sure what the way out is. You're not sure how to get through it, whatever, whatever the season is. But especially those that are tragic, those that are more difficult. The gospel is a firm reminder that sin, Satan, and death do not have the last word. And so we're reminded here, really, of the feast that is to come in Christ. I wish there was another way. <laughs> I wish there were other alternatives I can share with you. But there's only one. It's in Christ. And so that becomes our hope. But even when things are foggy, things are dark, that the hope that's been embodied in the personal work of Christ is already ours now by faith. And will be ours in eternity for all days. And that's the hope that we cling to. That's the hope that James is leaving you with as he ends this letter. Do not let your circumstances dictate who God is. Let him remind you who he is. Let him be your anchor. Let him continue to be your hope. But today and in days to come. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for this time that we can gather together as a people that some of us are bruised and broken and tired. Other, others of us might be in a season of life where things are going well. It is good. But we want to come as one body before you to simply say, you are worthy, Lord, to be worshipped and adored. Father, some of us are still in that season, still in that rhythm of life where prayer is an obligation, and we have not yet moved to a point where prayer is adoration. So Lord, I pray that you would work in us. Continue to have your way where we can want to be with you, and subsequently then in the process, want to move towards others, to walk with them, and to have them walk with us. Father, thank you that you do not leave us alone to do this journey. You've left your word. You've left your spirit. You've left your church. Jesus, thank you for the hope that we have in you. So this weekend, as we rest, as we enjoy each other's company, as we relax, I pray that we would remember the finished work of your son and the hope that we have in him. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to transition to a time of communion, and I encourage you to use this time to pause uh, and reflect before you make your way up. If you are a follower of Christ, we're reminded um, in 1 Corinthians 11 that we do this to remember what he has done for us. We take part in his death. But it also draws our attention to his resurrection. And so we take part of bread, which is his body, and of the blood represented by the juice, which is his blood shed out for our sins. So we take communion to remember that we have hope. For those of you that are not followers of Christ, I encourage you to let this element pass you by, but to not stop wrestling with this God of Scripture and with this gift of his Son. If you need a prayer, seek out the leaders. Talk to me. But don't let this time pass without reflecting and wrestling with this God of Scripture. When you're ready to come up, I encourage you to come down the middle aisle and make your way down the side.